This is what the fourth dimension is. You have the astral series, but in between the astral series, just like here, you have spaces where souls can hang out in between lifetimes, or it's also where we as souls just go, literally just go to hang out at night when we leave our bodies. In my book, when I talk about astral projecting to other planets and speaking to people from other planets, what we here call aliens, most of the ones that I've met are, are just people like us. Hello, Selma. A warm welcome to the show. Hello, Yannicka. It's so great to be here. I can't believe it. I've been watching you for so many years and I've always wanted to, to, be, to be here and share what I have to share. <laughs> so thank you for having me, really. Uh, you're welcome. I'm really excited to have you because I know you have so much to share. I've seen a couple of uh, videos with you and you were on the Jeff Mara show with an extraordinary story to tell. Uh, and you are an author, a published uh, interdisciplinary social scientist, archaeologist, science historian, cosmological theorist and educator, so much more, a spontaneous astral traveler, uh, where you have had quite a few mystical experiences uh, going to different astral cities. And you're coming, what's interesting I find is that you're coming from this scientific background, wanting to find, you know, all the answers in that way. And then you end up having all these experiences that totally uh, explodes all sorts of belief systems and everything you thought knew. Uh, and uh, when I've heard, you know, what you actually have to say, I was quite stunned myself. I feel like I've heard a lot, but with you, I was like, oh, I really have to have an open mind for this. So I'm really curious about our conversation today. And I know it sort of started around 2012, which I think, again, is not a coincidence. So speak to me about what happened in 2012 and onwards. So in 2012, I was um, totally lost. I had ideas, fantasies of getting into a PhD because I knew within my core that I was a scientist, but I didn't know exactly what to do. So as a lot of people do, I just decided to go teach for a while, you know, as I'm trying to figure out what is it that I wanted to do as per research. Um, I find myself in Hong Kong after a huge trip around Asia. I find myself in Hong Kong. At one point, I remember just feeling incredibly lonely. It was the first time in my life ever where I felt lonely in this foreign place where I didn't feel like I had much in common with anyone. And mind you that Hong Kong is a city that is filled with people from all over the world, but I didn't feel like I had anything in common with absolutely anyone, just as I felt my entire life as, ever since I was a child. But as you grow up, once you feel like this as a child, as you grow up, you feel it more and more and more. It doesn't get better. It doesn't get any better. And especially as the world becomes denser, you feel that a lot more. So at one point, um, I come into work and um, this, this one child, for some reason, um, this one girl, she keeps singing this song that goes about, it's, the, song is, the song has these lyrics of all is well, all is well, all is well. And she doesn't stop singing this song. And at one point I just tell her, why can't you stop singing that song? Where, where have you heard that song? Did you, did you hear it over the weekend with your parents or something? And she says, yes, miss, it was this movie that I've watched. All is well, all is well. And she keeps singing it and like and dancing around the room in the most wonderful thing ever. And I'm in this terrible mood because you know, I'm feeling lonely. I'm doing something that I don't care about. I, I, I need to find my purpose. I know that I should be researching about something. I don't know what. That same, this was a Friday. That same Friday, I... Uh, go to bed and uh, I remember my apartment overlooked the, uh, the 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 South China Sea and I was in a really 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 high floor and I had these black birds all around me and I felt a huge kinship with these black birds as well I remember that day I fell asleep really early while looking while staring at the birds and it was still day there was still daylight and I almost felt like it was a hypnotic days with these birds like they were trying to communicate something to me Ever since I had studied in London, that I, I had this connection with black ravens, with birds, just birds, but above all black birds, I always, I would wake up to them. I always felt like they had something to communicate to me. So this one time I fall asleep and I close my eyes only to wake up in this, well, now, now I know what it is. It's this astral city. 
this place that was incredibly heavenly. And it looked more or less, it looked like a Mughal city, a Mughal city is from the, uh, um, an Indian city from the Mughal times, just so people can have an idea. The Mughal times, it's a time in India where uh, India had been um, invaded uh, by these uh, Muslim sultans. So the architecture, so the one good thing that came, the one beautiful thing that came out of it was the architecture and the art. So uh, the Taj Mahal, for instance, is from back, from back then. So, so you can have a, an idea of this city. There's this huge avenue surrounded by gorgeous, absolutely beautiful palm trees and other types of trees as well. At the end of it, African type of trees. At the end of it, you have something that looks very much like the Taj Mahal. Only, you know, that the Taj Mahal here is a mausoleum. And the Taj Mahal in that city, or what looked like a Taj Mahal of sorts, was a museum slash library. And I knew that. I remember that being there, being there, I wasn't myself. I was this lady with a very long side braid, uh, dressed in what looked like a bit of a post-modernist sari. So I looked like a like an Indian lady, like medieval Indian lady, but the sari looked a bit post-modernist as well. Like something that you'd see in a higher dimension and that it feels like we've tried to copy here, that here in 3D, we have tried to copy that, right? And I have this really long braid and I'm walking, I'm hopping and hopping and hopping towards the temple. I'm incredibly happy. Um, I remember the feeling is just a, a feeling of being home. I'm home, I'm home. I'm home, I know exactly what that place is. Let me go towards it. There are other pe people walking, walking around, by the way, but we're not engaging. And I'm very much determined to reach my temple slash library slash museum type of place. And when I get there, I have this experience. Um, someone calls me and asks me, who are you? And it's a male voice. Now, that day, on that specific day, in the meantime, I can listen to the song that my student had been singing. All is well, all is well. I can listen to this song in the ether in the meantime. So this only goes to show also that people always, people are always in our lives with a purpose. I almost felt like my student, who was like a six-year-old in this lifetime, on the other side was some type of ascended soul who was trying to communicate a message to me as well. And I almost feel like she was kind of a vehicle for me to return to that city that now I know I visit between lifetimes in the, in the 3D, in the density. But back then I knew, not, I knew nothing of this. So I just get into my temple and I listen to this male vo voice. Now, during that day, I had also read an article about a, a statuette at the museum, the, um, the History Museum in Edinburgh had had a weird phenomena where this tiny little statuette of the, the Egyptian god Anubis had turned on its own axis. And I found that the oddest thing ever. And I remember asking my guides before going to bed, can you tell me what went, what went on? Why is it that the statue had turned on its axis? What was the physical phenomena that contributed to that? Because I had the mind of a scientist. I'm like, no, this wasn't magic. Something happened in terms of the aerodynamics, physics of it, whatever, you know, the scientist mind. And as I'm in my astral city and I enter that temple, this man calls me and he asks me, who are you? And I remember I'm, you know, I'm an incredibly suspicious soul because I've had, I've led a lot of lives, lifetimes here on earth of darkness. And this is something that my guides are working on with me, my suspicion. I trust no one that I've never met or, or heard of before. It's horrible. It's pretty, pretty bad. And so this man is asking me, who are you? And I lied to him. I'm like, who are you? Like, who are you? And I tell him something like, I know, I, I got a vibration from him of ancient Egypt. So I said, I'm Maat, as in the goddess Maat, which is the goddess of word and of, um, uh, the, the, she's the librarian of the Egyptian god, the ancient Egyptian god Thoth. Uh, and uh, she's the one who writes the name of the pharaoh in the sacred um, tree of life uh, in order to breathe life into the next pharaoh. Anyway, so I, I remember just saying, I'm Maat. And uh, I look at him and he is the god Thoth. And uh, he looks at me and I download from him, no, you're not, like, stop, stop. And he had this attitude, which I found incredible. He had this attitude, Anubis, by the way, this was the god Anubis. 
he had this attitude. He's like, no, you're not. And then he's trying to discipline me as well, like child behave, like, what is your name? And then I say, Selma. <laughs> it was the weirdest interaction where I am this cynical, stubborn child, very suspicious. And I'm speaking to a God and I'm having a bit of an attitude. And he's giving me a bit of an attitude in exchange. Very much reminded me of my interaction with my own students at times. And um, at one point, um, he repeats to me, Selma, as in, this is your name. This is who we are now, as in, try not to be anyone else. And then this huge um, sort of dark hole opens under me when he says that, and I fall through it, and I fall into a dimension where all of a sudden I am surrounded by these Egyptian day, ancient Egyptian deities that I'd studied at university, Anubis, Tot, Maat, Osiris. Horus. I see them all walking in procession in front of me. And I just remember I had to scream out loud, they are real. The gods are real. Something like that, I say. And I wake up. But the most blissful thing about all of this really was that I'd been to my city. I remember waking up and thinking, that is home. I don't know where that is. I don't know how I knew the place because whilst, while I was there, I knew that place. But that, that was home. That, that's where I've come from. This is, this, I don't know what this is. This is not even real. That is real and that is home. And just the sheer bliss of being there. Then I would be, later, I would remember that these places are also places of learning, educational places that our souls go to in between lifetimes, not only to rest from this experience, the 3D experience, which is quite intense, as we all know, but also to learn things, hence why, uh, this particular astral colony had this temple slash library slash museum. Um, and uh, you know, hence why in this one instance, I was there, uh, I was there to learn the lesson as well, which was, you know, with the, with this God, with this Egyptian deity, I was there to learn humility from him and to not hide from who I am. So I go back to asking all of those questions that we as human beings ask when we are children. And then we are formatted by society into stop asking, right? I go back to that mode, to that child inquisitive mode, the first time when we are children that we look in the mirror and we do this face like, who is this? Who am I? <laughs> what is this place, right? I go back to that. So I went back to zero. I started reading all, all of the new age that I possibly could. I started listening to the Dolores canon. And, um, but for me, the trip would be a little different than what it may be for a lot of people. I didn't have a happy go lucky do yoga and meditate trip because a lot of other things had happened to me prior that had meant to me that I, that I'd come from a place of darkness and I had much to clear before I could understand everything. So for me, the path, it was a little different than it is for a lot of people. The path for me had actually started at, at this one time in my life when I was, I think I was um, 17 years of age and I was on my way to these French lessons. Um, by then I, 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 I grew up uh, really poor, but around the time that I was 15, 16, 17, life got better. So at one point my parents are, you know, are, are getting me French lessons. But I remember just feeling heavily depressed because I come from an incredibly chaotic home. Um, and I just remember feeling incredibly depressed about my, my just being here. I don't recognize this country. I don't recognize these people around me. Nothing speaks to me. These beaches, these people, everybody's so happy to go to the beach. I couldn't be bothered. I was that type of teen. And I'm so dismayed. I remember being so dismayed that that same day, I'm like, why, what am I learning French for? I don't want to be on this planet. I remember on that same day, I went to bed and I said, I want to go home. Can someone please take me home? I don't feel like this is home. I don't know what's going on. I'm really confused, but I don't belong here. This is wrong. This, I would just feel very much viscerally within me that this is wrong. There's something wrong with this picture. I don't belong here. I love my siblings. I love my parents, but I've got nothing to do with any of them. I don't feel like I should. It's, a, it's something that you cannot explain, which is I feel like this family would be really happy anyway without me. I don't fit into this picture. What am I doing here? I don't, I, I'm not supposed to be here. A feeling of I'm not supposed to be here. So I asked to leave. And that same night, 
um, an individual comes to me, I go to bed, I open my eyes and I see an individual coming to me and he's wearing a suit. Uh, this light opens, he's wearing a suit and he extends his hands to me. And I remember thinking, uh, <laughs> so there's something wrong with this picture too, because what I should be getting should be Jesus. According to religion, my parents are Catholic. Uh, I should be getting an archangel, God, someone like that. Like, who are, again, I enter that world, who are you? So you see why I'm suspicious. I have good reason to be suspicious. And I'm thinking, no, huh, who are you? Like, no, I'm not going anywhere with you. And sure enough, he disappears. Now I understand that that individual was a person of shadow. And that I'd been, I don't, I don't, I was not, I was never supposed to be here in this lifetime. It was a part of a group of souls that abducted my soul and brought me into this place. Um, and that's where it gets really complicated. Um, I didn't know this back then. I only found out about this maybe like two to three, two to three years ago. And that's when I managed to piece everything about myself right in time to publish this book. Uh, it's a good thing that I managed to figure it all, all out before publishing the book. So that's why I have a hard time trusting because I was brought into this place for this specific lifetime by the wrong crew. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just put it this way. So this is something that happens on this planet. Yes, most of us choose to be here because between lifetimes, we go to these astral cities, astral colonies of light, as I call them, and as uh, Brazilian anthroposophy calls it. And in these astral colonies of light, and mind you that almost every city on earth has an equivalent of an astral colony of light in the fourth dimension. Almost every city on earth. So Stockholm has one, uh, Lisbon has one, London has one, and I've been to a few of them, and they're all absolutely stunning and gorgeous. And we go to these places in between lifetimes to make a plan for ourselves um, with regards to what to do for a next lifetime. We always we we usually stay there between lifetimes to learn these places. They have schools, they have universities, they have hospitals, research institutes. They have all of these things, right? But in, a, in the heavenly plane, starting from the fourth dimension. But there's also an inverse plan. And, it, and that's a part of the game that is played in the 3D. You have the influence of the light and the influence of the shadow, the inverse plan. Now, we don't have to take it so seriously because again, we could see it as it's all a part of the evolutionary process of our souls. Um, but it would take me a whole other video to talk only about the inverse plan. And I know that that's probably not where you want to play to place focus for this particular video. But it exists. It's there. Um, my particular soul, um, I came into this planet uh, thousands of years ago for the first time out of my own willing, out of my own choosing uh, to become uh, my first lifetime here was as a mathematician a man, a male, and I was working with a, a famous uh, ancient Greek mathematician at the time in Sicily, in what is now Sicily, Syracuse. I was working with that man. That was my first lifetime here. Uh, I was already an ascended soul. Back then I was an ascended soul, but I came into this planet to help. I was working with this mathematician and I remember that at time, however, I became entrapped within the trappings of density of the third dimension. In other words, I became really obsessed with this experiment that I was working on, that we were working on. And in that lifetime, I became so obsessed with my experiment that I completely alienated everybody around me. I lost my partner, my wife, because uh, I, was, I was a man at the time. I lost everything. I alienated everybody because of the experiment. That's how obsessed I became. Um, and as a result of that, I plunged a little bit into the density of the planet. I let the 3D density of the planet envelop me. And I came, I returned another four times to try and continue that experiment here. I returned to planet Earth after that four times to try and continue that experiment. And it was a bit ridiculous at one point because what happened is that the centuries mo you know, moved on. Time just kept going. And so the experiment didn't even know any longer make any sense. But I became so obsessed with it that every time I would come in, I'd feel attracted to that experiment and I'd return to it. And I'd once again isolate myself, not have any friendships, alienate family, potential lovers. I would just, I was literally what you call a hermit for five lifetimes, uh, just obsessed with this scientific experiment. 
Uh, within the midst of that, I also then decided when I returned to these astral cities, an astral city of scientists at the time that I remembered also in the meantime, it was agreed that maybe I should have other experiences in other planets um, because my I was too much, I had too much of, um, because the earth experience was not right for me. And I was not a soul of the earth, like the, the souls that have come to this planet from this other planet, Capella, if you want me to talk about that later, I can also talk about, I was, I didn't fit into that. So I agreed to go to other planets, uh, other 3D planets that were more of a vibrational fit with what I was doing. And I climbed up the ladder of evolution and um, I, at one point, after many lifetimes, arrived at the sixth dimension, sixth to seventh dimension, where I'm now incarnating uh, in, um, in um, the avian, the avian race. Uh, at one point, I become a blue avian. So I'm having different experiences in, in, in other planets. And I always carried the imprint of the scientist, the space explorer, and as a blue avian, I was a, a space explorer precisely. And, but I, 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 I had this obsession with Earth. I wanted to return to Earth. And so my team and I at one point start returning to Earth to help the process here, to help the ascension process here. And we were working with scientists. So a lot of uh, the work, the Earth scientists, all through the centuries, I have great love for them because I've worked with them from the other side. May I jump in here shortly? Yeah. Uh, so it seems like you have an incredible, incredibly rich memory of uh, your soul, like your experiences as a soul. Uh, what I'm curious about is how do you know this? Uh, maybe I've lost some information or you said it, but uh, for me, you had that one mystical experience and a, a couple after. So how all of a sudden did you get all this information? Did you all of a sudden start to remember everything? After that first experience in Hong Kong, I returned, I returned to Europe, to my uh, country of birth, Portugal. And that one year in Portugal, I, I was remembering everything and more to a point where I had, I'm, I always have notes with me because as, as I would remember, I would have to write and I feel, Yannicka, to this very day that I started writing in, because intuitively I felt like if I didn't write, I would enter overdrive. It was too much. All of a sudden it was given to me in you, these huge waves of information. And for, for the first couple of weeks, I remember just staring at the walls like, what is happening to me? Can you imagine, Yannicka, remembering, remembering entire lifetimes whilst you are supposed to be sleeping, you go through an, another entire lifetime elsewhere, and then you wake up in the morning and you have to go to work. <laughs> well, how do you integrate this how do you be even begin to integrate this how can i know now go to my nine to five earthly nine to five job after having helped this mathematician in ancient um in ancient uh, in, in sicily in, in the classical times last night and the night before that being a space explorer somewhere how can i now go to work yeah, this doesn't that... make any sense it doesn't yeah. make any sense and I cannot imagine that. Now, what I'm curious about, and I, I think probably some will in my audience who are a bit skeptic will think, uh, ask this question. So how do you know that it wasn't just a dream, a very vivid dream? Fair, and that's fair enough. Well, I always give this disclaimer on my channel and on my book, my book, that's the first disclaimer, which is I require no belief. I do not want for people to believe me. All I'm doing in sharing is I want to plant the seed of inquisitive thinking in people. And I want for people to stop dismissing their own experiences. There is no way that you can know that what I'm saying is true because these are my own personal experiences. And in 3D, there's only two ways that we can know. We can either know through empirical evidence or through personal experience, through having experienced it ourselves. I know because I've experienced these things myself, but you can only know if you pay attention to your own experiences until eventually we may have empirical evidence because we will have technology eventually that will be able to scan through people's dreams. That will, that will happen. But for now, all that we have is the, the, the free will to not dismiss our own personal experiences. And because I know that everybody has had at least one experience with an astral projection or what people call lucid dreaming, where they say, this was real. And you just have the inner knowing of, 
this is real. It doesn't matter how much of a skeptical you are, because no one is more of a skeptical than a person with a scientific ethos. I was the scientist, and all of a sudden these things are happening to me. I wake up and I have no other option but to look in the mirror and say, okay, Selma, you need you need to use your rationality and your logic here. It felt more real than this. I don't know yet why, but I will find out. That was real, right? Mm. And so you know, you have an inner knowing. And you can only know whether my experience, you can't know whether my experiences are real, only whether your experiences are real. Anyone who is astral projected or who had, who has had what we hear called lucid dreaming of that caliber knows that it's real, how real it felt, right? And that, uh, again, if I just may say that I, I know that you mentioned that you started to question your reality. Uh, and I really identify with that because I did that as well. Like a few weeks, I was wondering what is real. And that was sort of, uh, to me, it felt a bit dangerous that I was questioning, okay, so what is this reality? If this is not real, I want to go to that real place, but I'm supposed to be here. So I can completely understand that feeling. Uh, now, uh, I'm curious about these astral cities because you said that was home, yet that was just the fourth dimension and you also mentioned that uh you were planning your life for people or souls were planning their lives there now mm -hmm. i've interviewed a few people who've had pre-birth experiences and some of them uh for instance christian sunberg he was just sort of a soul like not in um an astral city where things looked like here he met another soul who said, hey, have you heard about Earth? It's incredible. And he was like, no, what is that? That sounds incredible. So he seemed like he was not in these astral cities, uh, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. So uh, could you share a little bit about your knowledge on these astral cities? Like, uh, is it sort of that some souls just go up to fourth dimension and incarnate, and fourth dimension and incarnate, mm -hmm. and others sort of come from a higher dimension and down. Yeah, exactly. So oh, there's so much out there. This takes me back to Emanuel Swedenborg and his experiences that he had in the 19th century. There's this uh, astronomer, inventor, mathematician, Emanuel Swedenborg, um, was uh, born in Stockholm, but then I think he lived most of his life in Uppsala, um, who was an incredible scientist uh, of his time uh, from the 17th and 18th centuries. And uh, it was pretty much, you know, some people would say that it would be the equivalent to, you know, it would, it would be the Swedish Newton, or Newton would be uh, <laughs> the English Swedenborg. But eventually, Swedenborg had a change of mind because he started astral projecting spontaneously, like we do, like I've done, and incredibly prolific, and even more in a more even in a more prolific manner than I have. He's had incredible experiences, not just with astral projection, but also experiencing time lapses. And let me tell you, Yannicka, I, <laughs> he experienced most of his time lapses in Stockholm. I exp I've had a time lapse in Stockholm. So there's something about Stockholm. <laughs> um, I feel like in Sweden, I feel like there in that city, you have a couple of um, time lapse loopholes, at least. Anyway, so but that's in my book. People can go can go check it out if they if they want to know about time lapses as well. Swedenborg, in his several writings, because then he had to do what I had to do. He had to put everything into writing. He was a scientist. Let me put it all into writing and try and understand it. He speaks of different worlds and uses the language of religion because that's the only, uh, he was Christian Lutheran. That's the only language that he had at his disposal back then. So, for instance, instead of talking about astral cities of light, he talks about uh, many heavens, different heavens. Uh, instead of talking about the threshold, um, as I call it, he talks about many hells. Mm -hmm. And then for the uh, ascended masters, as we call them, or mentor, or light mentors, he calls them angels and archangels. But we're all talking about the same thing, right? But this was a man whose father was the Bishop of Skada, so the language of religion is what he, he, he has to use. But he's describing the same thing. And at one point, and this could answer your question, at one point, I was floored when I read this because this is these are my experiences as well. He talks about speaking from souls in the ether that inhabited the ether of their planets, but they weren't in in those astral cities or heavens as they, as you would call them. They weren't in the threshold uh, or you know one of those hells that he talks about, which are basically astral cities of density. Um, 
so where are these souls where and it what it says basically is that it speak is that every planet has a layer around it where you have souls stranded in the fourth dimension but not in the astral cities in between astral cities just hanging out and that's where a lot of what we call dreams also belong so this is what the fourth dimension is you have the astral cities but in between the astral cities just like here you have spaces you know you have spaces between the astral, the astral cities like let's call them astral roads astral paths where souls can hang out in between lifetimes or deciding where they want to go after this lifetime or simply because they are lost and because the, the fourth dimension is huge Annika, it's not just one thing it's not just where you have the astral cities it's also where we as souls just go literally just go to hang out at night when we leave our bodies and we don't feel like going to an astral city. We don't feel like going to an, a higher dimension. Or maybe we are not even a vibration yet for a higher dimension. So we stay in the in 4D and we hang out and we meet each other. We meet each other all the time in 4D. You know those dreams that you have where you're just meeting with people at the supermarket or the market or going shopping or you're just doing nothing, just talking babble or you're speaking to your family member just nothing special is happening but you're meeting people and doing things you're just busy and kind of mimicking our life here that's why we meet in places like coffee shops or schools or because we are we are mimicking our lives here in the 4d right so that also happens in the 4d right these spaces between the astral cities uh and um th there are spaces where we simply hang out in 4d that's why sometimes we wake up from a dream and people ask us, what, what was your dream? Oh, nothing special. Oh, but I think I met this friend that I hadn't seen in a very long time. That was you hanging out in 4D where we meet each other all the time. So I don't know if this answers your question. If maybe that, um, that, uh, that, 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 that person that came on your podcast, when he said that he was meeting with other spirits and souls, that was the fourth dimension of some other planet or this planet. And that happens to me a lot as well. I've gone to, I've astral projected into other planets where I'm speaking to people from those planets that are hanging out in their fourth dimension, in that layer after the earth, after the planetary crust. So when I say, when I speak of, in my book, when I talk about going astral projecting to other planets and speaking to people from other planets, what we here call aliens, I don't like to call them aliens very much because they're just most of the ones that I've met are, are just people like us. You know, I've gone to exoplanets where you have beings that look very much like us with a few differences. We meet in the 4D. I'm not meeting in the 3D with them because we are dream. We are meeting in what here we hear called dream state. So our consciousness are meeting. So where are we meeting in the 4D? Yeah, the the four D. Uh, I get that. That's sort of like this in between state. But isn't the astral series a bit higher? You said it was sort of like a heavenly like place. That that's five D. Let me tell you. At first, when I first started having these experiences, I assumed reading. When I I remember that when I first started having these experiences, I grabbed the book called The Alchemy of Nine Dimensions, the The Alchemy of the Nine Dimensions by Barbara Hand Cloud. And as I'm reading that book where she, you know, speaks of these nine dimensions of existence, um, she speaks of the dimensions up to the 12th, but the ninth dimensions of existence, according to her, are where we have the most experiences because the 12th would be the creator's dimension. And I remember thinking, okay, so these beautiful astral places that I'm seeing can only be the seventh, the eighth, the ninth dimension, something much higher. I've come to understand, and especially upon reading a lot on Brazilian anthroposophy and also French anthroposophy with Alain Kardec, um, and um, um, especially also Brazilian anthroposophy with Edgar Armand and Francisco Xavier, who are Brazilian spiritualists and anthroposophists from the 20th, early 20th century. I remember at one point I came to the conclusion, and I've, I've also confirmed this with a couple of my guides, that all of it is the force. Because those uh, those higher dimensions, those those higher light dimensions, start from the fifth, the fifth all the way to the ninth. So, when people talk about the fourth dimension, they most New Agers feel think of the fourth dimension as something mundane, and you can see it however you like, either mundane or not. But it is celestial. It's the ether already. Hmm. It's not where 
Jesus Christ is, I can tell you, it's not where the ascended masters are, but it's where we go to. Uh, the ascended masters are in the sixth and seventh and eighth dimension. Um, I can tell you that what I've been told is that Christ, the Christ consciousness is an eighth dimensional, what we would call Jesus, Jesus here, Yeshua, is a, um, a, a seventh to eighth dimensional being. So the fourth dimension of is, is the ether, is already celestial. Is this uh, true for all the souls of the planet or are there some souls coming from higher dimensions? Like you men mentioned the masters, but I'm thinking more like generally. Um, is that so sort of the rule that we all are fourth dimensional beings um, that and that we are evolving through that? That's sort of part of the shift in consciousness now that we're moving up in dimensions. One thing that has really helped me understand our process on Earth was reading Brazilian anthroposophy. And according to most anthroposophists of the early 20th century, there's a story called The Exiles of Capella. Um, the Exiles of Capella, and I'll have to ask you to, to, you know, this is quite a ride, this one, so I'll have to ask you to bear with me for this one. The Exiles of Capella is a story of the evolutionary soul process of the current earthlings, the current souls that are on this planet. And it says that most of the souls that are on this planet have come from another 3D planet that was ready to ascend at one point, 25, um, 25,000 uh, million years ago, this one planet was ready to ascend. It's a planet that is uh, in the constellation of Capella in the Northern Hemisphere. We can see it from the Northern Hemisphere. Because the planet was ready to ascend, it could not continue to tolerate the existence of these particular souls in its midst that were not interested in evolving. And so what it did was that those souls could no longer, at one point as the planet is ascending, those souls could no longer incarnate on that planet. And so they were basically exiled onto another 3D planet, but this time a primitive planet which was primitive Earth, Earth in its prehistory at the time. When I first read that story, uh, this, this, uh, the, the Exiles of Capella is a book that was channeled by um, this Brazilian spiritualist called Edgar Armand in the 1940s. Can you believe it? Someone coming up with, with a story like this in the 1940s. And that would explain, when I first read that, I remember thinking this, really resonates with me. I felt like I already knew about that story of the exiles of Capella. So basically what they're saying, what anthroposophy is saying is that most individuals who are on planet Earth uh, descend from the exiles of Capella because once here on planet Earth, that they then started reincarnating into these primitive species, which at the time, and I did the research, at the time when they reincarnated, they would have found here the earlier the earlier specimens of the Homo sapiens sapiens, which explains the modern human, which explains the jump then that we had between the Homo habilis and the Homo, the Homo sapiens sapiens. Um, they come into this planet, they inhabit this planet, and then they start reincarnating into successive waves of souls on this planet until today. Now, a lot of those souls have already ascended because it's been so many thousands of years. A lot of those souls have already ascended but um, too many of them are already here and they still constitute, according to this theory, the majority of the population of the planet. Now, that story resonates with me because it felt to me like remembrance when I first read it, but people obviously can take it for what it is. Again, until we have our own experiences, uh, we have no way of confirming another person's experiences and it can either resonate or not. Right. So you have a huge portion of the souls of this planet being exiles from another planet, from another experience where they refuse to evolve. And so they've had to start all over here. And because the problem is that when we, you refuse to evolve as a soul, you start regressing as above, so below. Right. Your own in the physical, also your brain, when you stop exercising it, neurobiology has already proven that when you stop exercising your brain, it actually shrinks. It starts shrinking physically. So as above, so below, as it is in the physical, it's also in the ether. When we stop progressing as souls, we actually start regressing. And that happened to me. Uh, that actually happened to me when I was um, 
back when I was abducted as a blue avian, I was abducted and brought into this planet. Eventually, because I was sunk into the sea, I was completely sunk into this 3D experience. Uh, I started devolving, right? Uh, and I managed to move out of it. And then I was, I, I was brought back for this lifetime. I was actually hidden in this planet, which explains why I've always felt like I don't belong here. I don't. I was not supposed to be here, but it's fine because I've actually taken on the opportunity now to do something good with it. It's what we do, right? Because once you establish a connection with with Gaia, then you have the opportunity to do something good for this planet and for the people in it. So you might as well take it. And so you have that majority of people who are exiles of Capella and who are on their path to, who should be working on their path to ascension now. But you do have minorities of souls from elsewhere, from what I've come to understand. You have minorities within minorities like myself, of souls that have literally been hijacked, abducted, and brought into this place by force. All types of shenanigans uh, happens in the 3D. People have no idea the type of crazy stuff that happens in the 3D. And you, I, I don't know this. I haven't had experience of but I've heard plenty of people say that they um, that there are also higher dimensional beings on Earth just doing the work of helping us progress. That to me makes sense because the first time I came to planet Earth, I was a higher dimensional being uh, when I first came into that lifetime um, as a mathematician um, thousands of years ago. Wow, there, there's a lot of new information here. Uh, I actually haven't thought of that it's a possibility that we can devolve. Like you're saying that you were a higher um, dimensional being and then you were uh, abducted. And it's it's just <laughs> sort of it's not shatters all my, it shatters all my beliefs about how things are. But, but that's what happens on this show that I'm expanding all the time what is actually uh possible uh now um there's a lot to talk about here uh i want to jump a little bit into those who do uh choose to come to this uh, planet who um reincarnate uh i yeah. know that you can say something about how we plan our lives and the process around it yeah. and then i understand that that happens uh, in this fourth dimension from your perspective. So I would love for you to speak a little bit about to, uh, to that. Okay, I can give you an example. I'm, I'm, I'm better at, at uh, um, showcasing things through example. Very recently, I had a dream where I was visited by this Brazilian lady. That help, happens a lot to me because I'm, you know, being Portuguese, born and raised, I'm a Portu na native Portuguese speaker blonde Brazilian lady comes to me and I'm visited by people that are on the other side a lot and I cross over a lot of them also when when they're stuck so if there's stuck spirit somewhere I, they will come to me and I'll have to cross them over if I can and she's talking to me as if all, we've always known each other I'm in an astral city of light I noticed that I'm in an astral city of light she comes to me and she's saying you know Selma I will go back I feel like I have to go back. I really want to do this. I really want to do this. And she she seems exasperated. And I see around her these um, light mentors. They have their hands on her, trying to calm her down, bring her energy uh, to a less chaotic state because she was feeling, she seemed a bit desperate and her guides are calming her down and saying, okay, like, you know, I'm downloading from them that they're trying to tell her, you can go you can go back but first you need to do the work first you need to do this you need to calm down you need to come from a vibration not of desperation but of wanting to help this individual and i woke up and i remember thinking i know this woman i know her face i have seen her face i know her i know her i know her that same night i go back to bed and i go to her mentors and i go to her and we are talking again and we are discussing the possibility of her coming back, but she looks calmer. Mind you, that time on the other side, um, I feel like a lot of time went, went on there from one night to the other. Time on the other side is different. It works differently, right? You know how time is a 3D construct. So on the other side, what to us here seems one day on the other side, it could be the equivalent to 10 years. It's, it's, look, it works very differently. So she was a lot calmer. And I remembered who she was while I'm talking to her now. I remember thinking, you are 
that lady that died in Brazil. I went back to this crime that happened in Brazil uh, recently. Well, a few years ago, not, not so recently, maybe eight years ago, I reckon, where this daughter did the unthinkable and um, agreed with her boyfriend that her parents should die, mm. this teenage girl. Uh, it's a very famous case in Brazil. Any Brazilians listening to this will know what I'm talking about because uh, I think her name was something Richthofen. Um, the last name was Richthofen, but I don't remember the first name anymore. And so she decides to kill her parents because she, they wouldn't allow her to date this boy. And uh, they stopped giving her money also. She was very, they were a very wealthy family and they stopped giving her money. They wouldn't allow her to date. <laughs> what is this? I'm done. She, she is what people here on this plane would call a psychopath, but there's more to psychopathy also to what people here brand as psychopathy than what most people know. But anyway, so um, the boyfriend together with a friend murdered her parents um, and they had agreed to do that all together. And this lady was her mother. And she was telling me that she had to come back as her child because she's pregnant now. Mm. She's gone to jail. Uh, she served for, I don't know, maybe 10 years, something like that, because in Brazil, you don't serve for long. Uh, it's a very weird system. And But anyway, there's no judgment. It's how it is. And uh, she served and now she, she, she's out and she's pregnant. And her mom was telling me, you don't understand Selma because I was having trouble understanding when I pieced it together. You are that lady. You want to come back? Like how, where? And she's telling me, you don't understand Selma. She's my soulmate. So, but as this lady is telling me, she's, you don't understand. She's my soulmate. Like I need to save her. What she's turned into this thing that she has become, I need to do something about it. I need to shake her. And that's, she, she's showing me an image of her wanting to shake her out of it. Uh, shake her back into humanity and into conscious awareness and into humanity she wanted and out of the density and of the darkness. And so she told me that her plan is to come in, uh, this was a month ago, that her plan was to come in as her child and she wanted to come in as a boy. Uh, and I remember thinking like, why a boy? And she's trying to tell me she, she has no respect for women. It has to be uh, it has to be someone with a really strong uh, young energy to shake her out of it. it. It needs to be someone that she will listen to, something like that, that she told me. So this is an example of how different it is, Yannicka. So when people ask me what happens on the other side, it really depends from case to case. There are people who get on the other side. It dep depends on the work you have to do. And they take 40 to 50 years to return. There are people who have already ascended, so they don't have to return to Earthly 3D anymore. They are now a vibrational match to an ascended planet, to a planet in the, in the, in the 5D or in the 6D even, but mostly in the 5D because you go from 3D to 5D. You cannot jump. You have to be a vibration to the place that you're going to. There are people who get there and immediately they want to come back. Immediately they want to come back. And you cannot do it immediately. You need to have done a certain amount of work before. So what happens with those people that say, I want to go back now. I don't want to be here. And there are stories like that as well. I remember at one point dreaming about a girl who was telling me, no, you don't understand. I was going to get married. <laughs> she was like, and she, she had this, she was so feisty. You don't get it. No, I don't want to go. I don't want to stay here. I, I, I was going to get married. This could have happened to me at the wrongest time. I'm going to lose my fiance. I'm going to lose him. I have to go back now. And that didn't end up too well for her because um, what happens to those souls that are too stubborn and don't understand that, that before returning, they have to do the work is that they end up detaching from these um, light um, astral colonies because they're not a vibration to the light. They become a vibration to the density. So they end up in the threshold, which is what here people like to call hell, purgatory, whatever, because that's what they are a vibration to. And a lot of them are fetched by these dense, these colonies of density that fetch them and tell them, oh, you want to go back now? We can arrange it. No problem. And, you know, and I've, I've come to understand now that that's what happened to that girl. The light spheres could not do anything to her because she was too much in density. She was too much of the physical dance experience. I have to go back now. I have to marry my fiance. My father was going to give us a house. You don't understand. Like we had everything going for us. She, she was too 
attached to the physical and that's a match to the lower vibrations to the to the to the um, colonies of low vibration so i feel like eventually she's gone to one of those colonies where they tell you that yeah you can go back now we will arrange it for you you go back you marry your fiance and it's all nonsense obviously because they can't make that happen those are souls who come into this planet mistaken they are literally lied to i've spoken i've gone I've asked Archangel Michael to come with me to these places of density. I know them quite well because back when I was hijacked, that's where they put me in a few of these places. I'm very well acquainted with the dense side of things. And I'm talking to these people that I already knew and I'm asking them, why are you doing this? Why are you lying to them? And what they tell me is because that's, that's what they want, free will. They want to go back. We just tell them that they'll go back. Because way too many souls coming through the back doors, through these columns of density, instead of doing the light work in the astral colonies of light, where they have to attend school. But it's not strenuous when you are of light and your light mentors are telling you, you need to attend a few, a few lessons with these ascended masters on, on calm or on patience or this. When you are of light, that's wonderful. I remember at one point being in one of these lessons in one of, one of these astral cities, in one of these... Um, it looked more like a conference. It was very academic, but very heavenly at the same time. When you are of light, you want to do the work. But when you are in a really dense frame of mind, you are not a match to that. And that's when you become prey. And that's when you return to this planet through the back door to do things that you shouldn't be doing here. Hmm. And that's been delaying the process of ascension of this planet, those types of souls. Uh, my oh my uh so many questions uh and so little time <laughs> for this i know is... right it's just so much Yannicka. and this, is, this doesn't even scratch the surface Let me i you. know i i can feel that um uh, okay several questions at once uh so is there a determined exit point uh because obviously she felt she uh left too early but if that was part of the plan, did she forget her plan? And didn't she catch up on what her plan was? Because to me, I would imagine that when you die, you will be like, oh, now I remember the plan. I exited now because of this and that and this and that. So it's sort of strange for me that she was like, oh, I want to go back if she remembered her plan. But maybe it wasn't her exit point. Maybe she left early. I, I don't know. But what do you think? Is there a determined exit point for us? We have what I'm what I've come to understand is that we have at least we can have at least two to different two to three different exit points. And out of free will, we choose which one we want to take. That again, that this that this doesn't apply to everybody because Yannicka, let's say that I have three exit points, okay? Let's say that I have three exit points. Uh, and that the latest one is at 73, let's say. But tomorrow, some drunk driver exerts their free will of drinking before um getting on a wheel and they run me over. I die outside of one of my exit points. I get to the other side a little pissed <laughs> when I realize this was not one of my exit points. So this can happen, right? And, and what's going to happen with that drunk driver, the person who exerted their free will, is that their free will infringed on mine. Excuse me. So this is huge karma for him or her, right? For whoever shortened my lifetime. Uh, when I wasn't supposed to to go now. What happens a lot also is that usually when it's not your exit point, you survive. If it's mm -hmm. an accident, let's say, right? You survive usually when it's not your exit point. Other times you get on the other side and your guides literally ask you, okay, this was not your exit point. Do you want to go back or do you want to stay here? If you go back, you have these many injuries. It's not going to be very pleasant for a long time. Da, 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 da. So this, it's all very layered. You see, there's no is black that, and white. Is that what near death experiences really is? A lot of near death experiences speak of situations like that, isn't it? Where they are speaking to light mentors or family members, asking them, "Do you want to go back or not? If you go back, it's going to be painful for a while, or you're go you have suffered this injury. Your life is not going to be the same." And usually when that happens, it's because it wasn't their exit point. That accident wasn't supposed to happen. It was another person um, 
in 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 free or free a, their free will or often it can be de a disease i've interviewed many who had a disease and then it's sort of not another soul who uh, does this to you it's actually they die from something and or they don't really die but they have a near death experience and that but that then seems like that was supposed to happen as well so I, i'm with curious. illnesses mm -hmm. yeah i was going to tell you with illnesses especially the likes of say cancer it is more than just often i'm not saying it's pre-planned before you come in but it has to do uh with things that happen in your life from what i've come to understand we have this life path and if i deviate from my life path that will have ref that will reflect on my health mm -hmm. uh, for instance i had a few years ago um vitiligo where i had this huge white patch on my face like that covered this entire eye it's um an autoimmune disease and it happens to you when you feel like you don't belong and when, when you engage too much in those feelings i don't belong i don't belong anywhere oh i don't want to be here when you self-indulge too much in that emotion you develop autoimmune diseases sometimes you develop cancer as well so those things some you know uh, religious people sometimes ask why does god allow for things like that to happen don't they uh, religious people ask that a lot it's not god allowing for anything it's you entering a place of density that is so 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 dark that has a, it has a reflection on your body there's something that you have not resolved that then translates into physical illness so that wasn't preplanned you don't I, you don't plan to have cancer no no you don't plan for that but it can happen depending on how you have lived your life and usually you you are hit with disease or severe illness when you detour from your life path when you are doing something else that you weren't supposed to do yeah that does make sense to me um i'm always curious though if it's meant to happen or not meant to happen but i it it doesn't really matter. I, I I don't know. Like maybe we cannot fathom, like because we cannot see it from the highest highest perspective. From the but, highest perspective. Yeah. Usually, when I see people who have cancer, the first thing I see is you didn't do with your life what you were supposed to. Yeah, and uh, I I agree. I resonate with that because I feel like people are getting sick and getting pains and ailments from not living truthfully. Uh, that's why I'm very passionate about people following their joy. I want to circle back to uh, your story uh, before we uh, start wrapping up a bit here, um, because you said you were abducted just to understand your understanding of who you are now. So you said you were blue avian and that you were not supposed to be here, but it seems like you've come to peace with that you're here and you're bringing something wonderful to the world and sharing this information that can help us understand more about reality. But yeah so uh, full circle who are you now and what happened you got abducted why and what what's the story there you know when the doctor tell diagnoses you with something when you spend years trying to figure out what is wrong with you when you finally get a diagnosis even if it's not good you're happy <laughs> because i know now i know and i can do something with it so i'm quite happy about it now that i've managed to, to piece it together i'm not sure that i can sum up this all i can say is that I've had all my life, I've had two dreams in tandem with one another. On one, I would see myself as the space explorer with a crew and we are constantly on our space vessel and everything around us is very blue, but I could not see me. I couldn't see how I looked like or how they looked like because we, we were all, we were always wearing um, helmets and these uh, sort of space suits, but blue, everything was very blue. I see that in tandem with seeing myself having been abducted and being in this sort of being being held captive, being held captive. Uh, for years and years and years, I'm having those two dreams in tandem, and I feel like I'm living two lifetimes in parallel, plus this one uh, as Selma. And so eventually I did something called quantum therapy. And my quantum therapist told me, I don't know how to tell, she was livid when she read my quantum the quantum mapping of my soul she was very livid and she said um uh, i don't know how to tell you this and i remember shedding a tear and telling her 
I know. <laughs> like, I know what you're going to say, but I couldn't believe it that she could see it. And but when she said the words, I cried for a week after that session. When she said the words, you but you've been abducted, and I told her I, again. I said, I know. Like I, I could not bring myself to spell the words because first it sounds too fantastic to be real. It's the stuff of sci-fi. And we're talking about someone who was incredibly skeptical. I was an incredibly skeptical person still at the time. But in my heart, I knew I just didn't want to see it because it didn't make any sense to me. No, we are supposed to go to the colonies of light and then uh, we are supposed to plan our lives. I was supposed to have planned this like everybody else. But again, it was a part, it was very important for me to learn this about myself also so I can tell people that the, the colonies of light and the planning are not all that are happening in this planet and people need to be aware of this, not be afraid. No, fear is counterproductive. And if we, if we are afraid, we are giving into the shadows precisely. But to just be aware that this type of stuff happens on this planet as well. So at one point as a blue avian, uh, while doing some field work on earth, I got abduct abducted by this other alien race that is not well intended, that doesn't like human beings. And I'm not going to get too much into that because that would give a whole other um, video. And uh, they hit me, uh, they, they hit me on planet earth having these lifetimes that didn't amount to anything. Uh, they used me on one of them to be a soldier. Um, very murder, a very murderous soldier um, in what I, I feel like uh, could be Salahuddin's army. I see myself storming the doors of, uh, storming the walls of, um, of Jerusalem and killing, killing, killing. And I wasn't myself. I was like something, a machine, but I wasn't myself. And I felt very much one with the other soldiers. That's the shadows working. And I saw that, I saw that another lifetime where someone, this husband took my children away from me and I turned very much into a psychopath after that. I just feel, I remember, I've never had children in this lifetime, but I know the feeling of losing your children. Can you imagine? Um, I never saw my children ever again. It took him across the pond. I, I remember thinking across the canal. So I feel like I was in France and he was English and he took my children never saw them again. And after that, I developed a hatred of men and I became an assassin um, uh, by hire in that lifetime, medieval lifetime. Let me jump in there. So from what I understand, you were hijacked, You're like you were a blue avian on a planet or, or on a spaceship uh, having a wonderful time with your people. And then someone hijacks your soul in a way and you get mm -hmm. stuck in a reincarnation cycle as yeah. something that's not yourself, like you're yeah. controlled. Yeah. So yeah. basically, when we descend to Earth for a mission, for one of our several field missions that we would do on Earth, uh, we, we are supposed to get beamed up into our spaceship. And the, we, but we had someone that infiltrated the mission and didn't allow me to beam up. Like the beam, beam me up, Scotty, Star Trek, I swear. This is why I tell people that all of these Star Trek writers, they are nothing but mediums. They are channeling technology that is already out there and is used by other alien races and will eventually be used by us. But anyway, uh, that moment is horrible when I, I, I the memory is the most horrible memory that I have of him not allowing me to beam up and me realizing I'm stuck on this planet. And I don't see what happened after that. And it was only after I had my quantum therapy session that I saw a little bit of the rest, which is they took me to their planet they started experiment they experimented on me uh they've created hybrids uh, they've taken parts of my uterus they've taken eggs for me things because they wanted to create hybrids between the blue avians and them but they've literally taken chunks of my uterus as well which is why when i and then um then did away with me uh then then killed me and they um hijacked through energy my consciousness the, because these are advanced, technologically advanced uh, civilizations. Through, they, they hijacked my consciousness and reincarnated me onto Earth to have all of these lifetimes of density that you had here in the Middle, in the middle Ages and things like but, that. Um, how did you get out of this? And sort of, uh, how did you become the well, wonderful you are today? 
my last lifetime on earth of those those lifetimes that group of lifetimes that they brought me to earth to to have my last lifetime was in the 1940s in germany and um i died there um that i did i detailed that lifetime in my book uh my name was i my name was esther i remember waking up from that memory and someone whispering in my ear your jewish name is esther and um i died there my fiance died there um and uh, his name was jacob that was the last one after that lifetime what happened is that my avian family finally found me mm-hmm. and i've had a dream where i've seen them telling me finally file uh, through telepathy i'm getting from them finally you don't know how much we have looked for you the avians they live for centuries and centuries and centuries so my my avian family they are still there much older but they are still there because they live for many 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 centuries they found me and so after that lifetime which was i'm still recovering from the remembrance of that lifetime i think you can see that that was very shocking to me um and uh i was stuck in darkness for a very long time i was because i was uh, the day that i died was too sudden i um i uh, my fiance gets shot and then everything goes black and then i was told you got shot also everything just went black and i was catatonic but i was catatonic after i saw them shooting my fiance because he was a friend are you in the german life now in 1940 is that what you're speaking about yes Yes, okay. yes. Sorry, it's too much, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. So, I was kept a tonic after that lifetime. My consciousness, my soul, I was stuck in that moment. I just stayed like this frozen for a while in darkness. And uh at one time these friends from that lifetime, these friends many many decades ago, these friends they who had already crossed over, they come to me and say, "Yes, Esther, yes, did this this did happen." they're trying to wake me up this happened you have to accept 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 the only way that i could wake up from that catatonic state was to accept because i wasn't expecting it um it, it was an acquaintance so you get me i understood then what shock is and so i accepted and then also is when but my friends are trying to shake me up from this in the meantime in tandem with this my avian family understood where i was and they go after uh the people who hijack me the, those that alien race that hijack me but what did what do they decide to do just when my friends are trying to bring me into the light into an astral city of light again they grab my consciousness they sn- they snatch it and they bring me into this lifetime and they hide me again on planet earth in this family in portugal and this is like this is the stuff of sci-fi but again I don't I don't need for anyone to believe me. I don't want for anyone to believe me. Just pay attention to your own experiences and don't dismiss them. I'm literally only exposing myself and sharing these things which I know are incredibly out there. So as to plant the seed of inquisitive thinking in people and ask them to not dismiss their experiences because we are getting asked by spirituality right now to wake up to what is out there, to what is happening and to the traps in which we have been falling as souls so that we can evade this karmic cycle of hardship in this planet and finally step into the phase of this planet this planet is just going to be a school planet uh which is going to happen also in a couple of decades by the way the karmic cycle of hardship is finishing and the souls of density are not going to be able to reincarnate here anymore soon enough that's good to hear and to sort of come full circle and wrap up a bit here uh what is the good news uh from your perspective The great news is that we are waking up. I uh, I've woken up when it comes to myself about all of these things. At first it was horrible, but then it was freedom. It was me thinking I'm freed. I'm freed from them because now I remember they can't touch me anymore. They can't snatch me anymore. It took me waking up and this is what people have to do to leave the density. To not stay stuck in our emotions. For instance, people like me who feel I don't belong here. Don't stay stuck in that emotion. What do you mean you don't belong here? We are the universe. We belong anywhere in the universe. Take the chance that you're having this experience now to do something good, to leave something good. When it comes to me, I'm sharing my experiences in the hopes that I will help other people wake up to their to their multidimensionality and to what and who we are. 
and to the process that we are being a part of, right? We are waking up and those are the great news because to wake up is to have your power back and to not fall for the games and the tricks of the shadows anymore. For me, this was this lifetime is the lifetime. The, this lifetime is the lifetime where everything shifts and I've come to understand that it's not just for me. This is the lifetime we, where we get to shift either to 5D and this is the thing, when I first heard Dolores Cannon say that, I felt that in my soul that this is it. This is the life where we either shift into 5D and ascend with the planet, or we get kicked out if we refuse to evolve and to ascend. Just like the souls of Capella did. Wow, fascinating. My oh my, um, thank you so much for coming to the show and, and sharing your story and perspective and experience. and. Um, I'm wondering what you think about uh, this question. Uh, what is the deeper meaning of life? I feel, what is the deeper meaning of life? I feel like the question would be, what is the deeper meaning of existence? Which is to experience, not take anything too seriously and just have lots of fun with it. Even when you find out things of darkness, laugh it off. I was a psychopath in another lifetime. I mean, I'm sorry. I have to laugh. Can you imagine me? <laughs> it's the experience. It's like we are actors in this play. Don't take anything too seriously because end of the day is what we are actually made of. And I've been to those dimensions, seven and eight. Seven. What we are actually made of is so silly. Here on planet Earth 3D, we would find it in our cynicism, we would find it silly. What we are actually made of is love, pure love and joy and giddiness. We are like these giddy children <laughs> in the upper dimension, just like constantly in love, bubbly, bubbly and in love. There's this experience that I narrate in my book of being in one of those dimensions. And it's like, I'm, it's, it's, it's being belated. It's being in love with everybody and with yourself because everybody is yourself. So <laughs> it's in love, this is who we are. So for us to come down to these denser vibrational places to have these experiences, it's like, I mean, sometimes if I think of it, I have to laugh. And then I go back to what that student of mine, that six year old told me in Hong Kong, all is well. <laughs> Did you know? All is well. Dance, dance, dance. Live, uh, have fun. Uh, thank you so much, Selma. This has been wonderful and so interesting. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, where people can find you if they want to connect with you or uh, what are you working on right now? You have this book, uh, is there, and that's out. It's published and uh, people can find it it's been published for two years now images of cosmology and the Gaian project where new age philosophy and astral projection meets the science so the first part of the book is conversational is me telling about my astral projection experiences and then I counterbalance that with a bit of scientific academic writing but which I try to make accessible to people who don't have an academic background and couldn't be bothered with all the jargon right um and um People will also be able to find me. They can find the book on Amazon, uh, the ebook, and um, the, the the hard cover, the soft cover, by the way. And people can also find me on my own channel, Selma Hair, Selma Hair on Facebook and on Instagram as well. That's it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming to the show and all the best with your work. Thank you, Yannick. All the best to you as well. My pleasure.